Hey, club members, we're back with First Issue Club Podcast. Welcome, club members, into the First Issue Club Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. We got a hell of an issue for you guys today. We're talking gender. We're talking romance. We're talking politics. We got all the hot issue (laughs) buttons here for you. It's a button-filled, tiny button-filled, small button-filled issue for you. Mike D, what are we talking about this week? We're going to be talking about the Snagglepuss Chronicles, Rogan Gambit, and Rise of the Black Panther. Yeah. All first issues, duh. Oh, what do you know? Mm-hmm. And they all came out on what week? Uh, these were January Wednesday, 3rd. Day, January 3rd. Boom. If you walked into your shop and grabbed these, you'll read them with us. If you didn't, you're about to get your mind blown. <laughs> All right, guys, let's get to know our club members. Um, Since we're talking about Rogue and Gambit today, um, I wanted to know, since Gambit throws playing cards as his power, if you had his same powers, what would you choose to throw? This is Greg Lichtai, and mine would obviously obviously be uh, pepperonis. Because I love love pizza, pepperoni pizza, so goddamn much that it's always going to be readily available. Because nine times out of ten, if you see me, I'm in front of a pizza. <laughs> and so, and I feel like you can really just flick those things. Like, you yeah, probably you get some yeah. good distance oh, totally. on them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that, that would be mine. All right, this is Budget King, and mine would be um, those sticky hands that you get out of a vending machine. <laughs> and, like, whip things <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> would you be worried about them coming back to you? Ooh. Yeah, that might be a bad idea, because it comes back and hits me. I would just have to be a master with it. Maybe a bullwhip. Yeah, you know, kind of the same thing. You're throwing bullets. You're still holding people? it. Yeah, you've got like 40 bullets in a backpack. Uh, my quiver full of bullets. Yes. And cat of nine tails. Oh, oh my, my God. goodness. I'm Mike DeStacy, and I would throw ball gags, and they'd go right into your fucking mouth. So you would stop spewing nonsense and blow your jaw off. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> we can all sleep tonight. Great. Uh, uh, I'm Caitlin Morosley, and I would throw inhalers. <laughs> you have enough of Could them. You have they, would, they would have a double feature, though, that I would fill them with something like like walnuts. pepper spray. <laughs> yeah, oh, pepper walnuts. Spray. So I could, like, spray them, and I could throw them. Oh. Mm. All right, let's get this podcast started. All right, kiddos. Let's talk about Rogue and Gambit, number one, by Thompson and Perez, published by Marvel Comics. So, Rogue and Gambit are X-Men characters, with an on-again, off-again relationship. You probably already knew that. This book starts with them off again, um, but after a complicated conversation we see between the two trying to just be friends, the couple gets an interesting mission to look into a private retreat for mutants that the new captain of the X-Men believes is a front that is holding mutants against their will. So Rogue and Gambit are the perfect candidates for this mission, Given their past, they'll probably be more believable as two people with baggage who are trying to work out their problems. My first question for you guys is, did this book turn you on? <laughs> like sexually? In my yeah. pants? Yeah, 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 yeah. Turn you on in uh, your pants? Was there enough hot, hot tension in it? You know what I loved about the uh, hot, hot tension? Yeah. Is as 35-year-old single people, I have to assume that's about their age, roughly my age as well, Mm -hmm. they're still talking about kissing and making out with people. I've been married for a while. I assumed that if you date people and you're single and 35, you have sex. (laughs) But I like this turned me on because I'm a very beta male. I would just be into the kissing for about (laughs) a year or so. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And so I'm glad that Rogue and Gambit share that same uh, issue with uh, intimacy like I do. I think at face value, this is a fun comic to read. I think if a lot of people's entry point for X-Men was the super popular 90s uh, cartoon, that being said, I think this is written like a relationship in comics that you would write in the 90s and doesn't really take into perspective a little bit of uh, maybe how women want to be approached 
or uh, yeah. c- convinced okay. to be into a relationship these days. Are you talking about Gambit? <laughs> <laughs> and his misogyny? <laughs> yes. Uh, Why you gotta think so much, baby? Just let me touch you. <laughs> right. It's essentially Gambit. Yeah, at every turn, he's trying to physically put uh, put himself on her. Yeah. And, and I don't know, go ahead. That, that could be a purposeful um, thing. A woman wrote this book. I don't know if you guys knew mm-hmm. that. Um, Kelly, T- Kelly Thompson. Thompson. Kelly Thompson, that's right. She wrote Hawkeye. Yeah, she did. She's awesome. She's incredible. Yeah. So, yeah. She might be trying to shed some light yeah, on... Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. To your point earlier, BK... Um, <laughs> Very. This is a very nostalgic book to read. As someone who grew up in the 90s, there's a lot of nostalgia for 90s stuff right now. This, to me, felt like a comic book for those people who are walking through the comic shop or like, I remember X-Men, I remember Gambit, I loved him on the cartoon. Mm-hmm. You jump in and they're in the danger room fighting a <laughs> sentinel. They bring which, sentinels back, yeah. Yeah, which if you haven't read a X-Men comic in a while, sentinels are long gone. Right. And you don't see much stuff in Danger Room anymore either. I think he mentions that when Storm brings up the Sentinel game, it's like, well, that's a little vintage, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So they're they're hearkening back to, like, maybe the better times of their relationship and when these two characters were, like, super, super popular, mm-hmm. 20, like, 20 years ago. Yeah. I hope they get into, which maybe this is a couple's retreat, they get into, like, they're honestly, like, late 30s. Yes. They gotta be, like, 40-ish. By now. Yeah. Right? And they still That's don't know how to make a relationship work. <laughs> I have a question for you guys. Who Do you does? know any X-Men <laughs> couple that's worked out? <laughs> it seems like everyone's doomed um, in a relationship. I mean, did Jean, Sy- Ger- Jean Grey literally had to kill herself to get away from Cyclops. Cyclops yeah. <laughs> I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, a lot of Wolverine's like parenting relationships kind of work, like him and Kitty Pride, And him and X-23 or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, but, like, as far as r- romance goes, I mean, that just kind of says that, like, if you're in the X-Men, you don't really have time for anything else. No. Yeah, Maybe just slapping demanding. skin together, but <laughs> as far as making anything grow. I imagine X-Men is a lot like the Olympic Village, uh, where you <laughs> <laughs> you have just exhausted oh. yourself physically, and you just want to have tons of sex. Yeah. Oh, Carnal, to- just... Totally. So you're a young person that's been plucked from the world and thrown into this like mansion full of people who are cut yeah like it's like a mutant grotto pri- yes exactly like yeah you'd get down because now you're up you're with people on your own physical level that can just fucking give it to Plus people you that all can have like shared you. trauma yeah fuck yeah yeah <laughs> that being said ramp up the sex downplay the misogyny and uh isn't it also, Unless that's something she wants to explore a little more. I don't know. Because they are going through this retreat process. So maybe, yeah, maybe he, like, she changes. has some things in store. The way that they draw this uh, retreat, though, I wish my wife and I had more marital problems because I would love <laughs> to be on a floating <laughs> house <laughs> in this paradise. The way that they drew the first We're two pages was kind of awesome in my opinion, too. Yeah. The art's really good. It's really good. I, I loved that whole amalgamation panel yeah thing. The, the first two pages are really cool and it kind of shows their relationship as one everlasting moment wherein they're always in flux or in some different state of their relationship yeah. forever entwined but in chaos and love <laughs> yeah but, is anyone else bored by that <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, fuck. But I was worried that this book was going to be like super existential after yeah. these two pages <laughs> and then it turns into like a fun romantic romp yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like immediately after <laughs> A romantic comedy with mutants. Yeah, exactly. I'll take it. I really liked it. I think comic books are such a good medium for romantic fiction, and you don't see it a lot. Um, But that doesn't make sense to me. I strangely, although I have my criticisms, did find myself liking it as well. Yeah. (laughs) I think I'll be picking up the second issue of this. I think I will too. After talking it out, I wasn't sure that I wanted to see where it was going, but I think I enjoyed it more than I... I want more info on this island. I just really yeah. like... That's Definitely one of the, the benefits yeah. of having, like, a reading club or people that you mm-hmm. talk these things through with. Can I bring up another thing about Rogue? Yeah, let's sure. see. Her, like, arm gloves that she has to wear mm-hmm. everywhere. Mm-hmm. Why wouldn't she just wear, like, a jumpsuit? Like, I feel like she... So in case someone, like, bumped your shoulder or something? Yeah, it's like, why... It's why... not sexy. Why... Oh, okay. 
There we go. <laughs> All characters have to be sexualized mm-hmm. somehow. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. As a rule. Oh, also, if you guys want to t- uh, tweet us your favorite X-Men couple on the Twitter, go ahead and do that. I'll post the funniest one. Next, we got Rise of the Black Panther out on Marvel number one, written by Tanahasi Coates and Evan Narcisse, and illustrated by Paul Renaud. Coates is the advisor. Uh-huh. He selected the guy that Evan that wrote the book. This okay. is Evan's first book. As may, many of you know, that the major motion picture of Black Panther is coming out. So this, in some ways, is the setup to that movie, at least giving us a backstory to that movie. Tanahasi Coates was famously uh, picked to uh, re-up Black Panther a couple years ago, and people loved it, went fucking crazy over it. Um, and he is, I'm a fan of his, is just an author um, in general, and a scholar. He wrote um, Between the World and Me. He's a very published author. Uh, um, uh, he uh, wrote right for Atlantic and Time magazine. He is kind of like, essentially, in this time period one of the like foremost voices on race and um in the world and he's super awesome you should totally pick up anything that he has written him being asked to do black panther was marvel's nod and acceptance of of not really having a huge diverse of writers and 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 people and then also kind of uh dipping into like what black panther means did you guys know black panther was the first black superhero ever published in comics i did not know that no Mm -hmm. i don't think i did yep predating luke cage uh-huh. Anyway, in in Rise of the Black Panther, we have um, discovering of the backstory of Wakanda, which is the secret world um, where Black Panther is from. Um, he is the king of that world, and he is also um, the superhero outside of that world, both protecting inside Wakanda and, and, and outside of Wakanda. This is going to be a clear, just set-up origin story of Black Panther, and this this entire comic book is just setting the actual childhood story of T'Challa who is Black Panther. Here we talk a lot about, like, gender issues and who are comics for and what are they write and uh, or who are they written by and all that kind of stuff. When Coates originally took on Black Panther, um, the arc before this, who is the advisor for this, he wrote that, um, I've come to really, really see, or what I've come to really, really see is that a lot of times male comic book fans use comic books as a kind of male bonding exercise, a kind of exercise in power, like power fantasy. I don't think that's particular to what folks want out of Black Panther, but I think that is something that happens in comic books. It's it's in is it's in as much as they say the the way uh, the way that people talk about say football. Do you know what I mean? They're projecting things out into the character that they and they want certain things to be just so. And I thought that it was like really really awesome that he was like, "Listen, you're not going to get this male machismo character out of this. Like I'm going to give you something else." And I think that's like what totally fucking happens in this book too even though Coates is just the advisor on this book. And what do you guys think about that kind of struggle between giving the male dominated fantasy kind of candy versus giving some literary chops to something? Oh, it's like the difference between watching like an Oscar winning movie and Transformers 4. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, when you go to Transformers, you know what you're going to get. It's going to be an eye candy explosion. Mm-hmm. But there's no depth. It doesn't leave you like wanting more. I don't care about any of the characters in a Transformer movie. Right. You know what I mean? Hold your tongue. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> kidding. Uh, but. You know, by the end of this book, we see Takala as a, you know, little boy who's put in a position of weakness, and he's got this really complicated background that he'll never be able to, like, grasp and understand and comes to terms with as an adult, you know what I mean? So he's already such a complex character, and if he was a badass that just is always punching guys and winning, who the fuck cares? Right. Who the fuck cares? Mm-hmm. I love I love that sentiment. Yeah. I do too. I like the separation between creators and fandom. I think it's it's more and more it's increasingly becoming a problem where people want stories that are self satisfying and that's not, in my opinion, and in the opinion of a lot of other people, the job of creators to do. No. 
you you can consume what they create and you can like it or you can have another opinion about it. But it's not their job to make sure you like it. Right. Most men under 30 kind of have this warped idea of what a man should be. And for comic book readers, this book is our medicine wrapped in cheese. The cheese is the comic book itself and the drawings and the, the superhero world. But there's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of uh, kind of thoughts in here that we kind of need to to be not really force fed, but kind of just put into our minds and kind of burrow in there and for us to mill over and really think about. And maybe, hopefully, subliminally, they'll, they'll change us for the better. I love it. Dr. Phil on <laughs> comics. Don't piss awesome. on my shoe and tell me it's raining. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this cheese has a pill in it. Yeah. Uh, so good. New tagline for Dr. Phil. <laughs> That's a new t-shirt. This cheese has a pill in it. No, the point the point the point is so wonderful yeah. and well put. Well illustrated. That yeah, since since comic books started as a medium, it's been a place for people, escapism. Escapism and people in a place of oppressment to tell uh, oppression to tell a story about overcoming adversity and intolerance. And tolerance. <laughs> this is a story <laughs> about <laughs> tolerance. We told you guys at the top of the hour this is going to be a heavy one. Yep. <laughs> uh, and and I think that also like look at Storm. For for a large period of time in the X Men, she was really just the check the box. We got a black X Men, right? And did like no development, just an afterthought of of that type of stuff. And that happened for a long period of time with black characters. And so the fact that we uh, there's this is the fourth that I know of. There's also Black Panther and Crew. There's there's four titles that one got canceled, but there's four titles of Black Panther that kind of were making their ways in the last two years for this character who is from Africa, who has a whole populate, a whole country full of, like, black, interesting characters. Um, quite an about face, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it also, this comic flourishes when it's told through the black lens. And what a huge task to feel like you're shouldering, like, okay, I have to tell this right, but it also has to mm-hmm. be interesting. All the white shitheads have to like it too. <laughs> right. Or yes. else if they don't if they don't buy it, the comics book gonna uh-huh. gonna be canceled. So I have to walk that line. And I also have to represent like what I know t- is true. Mm-hmm. Um and so that to me would just be overwhelming. I would just say, I'm not the person. I can't <laughs> I can't do it. Like so to to accept that that ch- burden and then perform so well is kind of an amazing task. I like this book a lot, if that is not apparent. <laughs> 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 All right, now we have another installment of A Couple of Thoughts with Greg Lichtai. And Caitlin Rossick. This week we are covering Exit Stage Left, the Snagglepuss Chronicles from DC and Hanna-Barbera. Art and words by Russell and Feehan. So continuing the the medicine wrapped in cheese comes the Snagglepuss. <laughs> uh, he finds himself in the midst of the Red Scare, although he may not know he's going to be soon under scrutiny. Snagglepuss is like this playwright. I don't know if you know a whole lot about the backstory. I didn't. I still don't. But from this first issue, you gain that he is a a playwright. He is also uh, hiding his homosexuality from a lot of the Hollywood scene. He does have a wife in Lila Lyon, but she is, uh, for all intents and purposes, a beard. She is a cover for him to be accepted into this Hollywood society. Um, he, he receives a lot of worried warnings from people in this first issue about his career, about becoming a has-been, about his government from his lover who is talking from a a perspective of a Cuban American, maybe, or just, um... I think it's a Cuban American, yeah. Okay. And, um, also about his lifestyle, uh, with, uh, I think that they, he is friends with one of the women who is called in to testify uh, about communist ties, and he's talking to her at a party, and she gives him kind of a worried warning about that, too. So this first issue is, like, you jump into his life, but he's getting... There's this foreboding sense all over the place. 
Uh, he doesn't seem to be affected, either that or he's just hiding it very well and not really showing it to the people around him. It looks like this book is going to try to tackle quite a lot of things. Yeah. Um, moral ambiguity, culture wars, people living in fear of their government, tolerance, inclusivity, and show business, just to name a few. So, I mean, I really enjoyed this, but I do want to throw it to you guys, and is this too much? I mean, you've even got Huckleberry Hound showing up. So, a quick little update for everyone. Um, DC has been doing this thing with Hanna-Barbera for a couple years now where they take popular Hanna-Barbera cartoons like Snagglepuss or the Jetsons and the Flintstones and Rough 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 and Ready, which we have covered on this uh, podcast, and they kind of um, modernize them. They put them into the real world, and they put them into kind of real and, because it's DC, dramatic situations that they don't really... They weren't really put into when they were uh, first uh, created in the 50s. They were just common cartoons that were slap-happy, just humor, meant for children. Uh, so Snagglepuss, uh, if you don't know, is a pink cat. Um, I don't know what his cartoon was. I don't know what his character was in the cartoons. I think he was just a pink cat that... I don't think he was, was a playwright was or he any like kind of... Or eccentric? He w- yes. So Snagglepuss, like escapes i think from the zoo or he's like always escaping from like a a cage oh, so, so he's a panther then he's like a panther right he's like a pink panther kind of like uh, okay. knockoff sort of thing and he, he has a lisp in my he right? has a lisp so going if you went back and watched Snagglepuss now if you watched it as a kid and went back and watched it now you'd be like oh my gosh this pink cat has such a flair and like is using like seven letter words and has this like ridiculous list <laughs> uh and they're is, like they're intentionally trying to make him like a trope of flamboyancy oh obviously yes yeah so it's this so, comic sans lisp by the way mm-hmm. yeah i didn't detect a single lisp. right mm-hmm. which honestly great call <laughs> on the like because it's if they're gonna make him gay yeah then like why may like you know they you know, I don't know. Like, they, what a trope to to just go ahead and throw out. Mm-hmm. I think I, I I will say though on that note, a playwright. I mean, if he was, I don't know. Like, I can't think of a real more gay job for him to have had. <laughs> he's a he's a <laughs> southern gothic style playwright. At <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> the front of this book has him like dressed as like a yellow Colonel Sanders. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> essentially just like a feline Mark Twain. Yes, totally. We've had this the same thing occur in Rough and Ready. Yes. If, if, if you don't remember that episode, go back and listen to it. It was a banger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we have um, animals existing with humans. In this world, we're set into like 1950s Red Scare kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Strikingly, though, in the illustrations, animals choose to not wear pants. Ever. That catch you guys off guard, or was that just no. par for the course for this the one? The first thing I said about this book is that Snagglepuss is letting it swang on the front <laughs> cover. And I'll say that his dick isn't hanging out, but the way it's, like, positioned, there's, like, this camera masking his furry crotch. Mm-hmm. And you can just, your the first thing your eye does, I feel like, is Fill a penis in right there. I'm holding it up for <laughs> the club yes. right now. Yes. When 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 Huck, it's a clear V. When <laughs> when Huck when Huckleberry uh, Hound enters stage right, he should just have a, a massive dripping ball sack like most basset hounds do. A big old droopy ball sack. Aww. Hey Snagglepuss, you got a towel for my ball sack? <laughs> do you think he always has blue balls? Uh, uh, Huckleberry Hound is a blue, blue dog. Oh boy, easy joke. Yeah. Is that where the phrase "blue dog Democrat" comes from? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is that a, is that a phrase? It is a phrase. I've never heard of that. Huh. Mm. Yeah, there is a lot going on here. I don't even know. There's so much going on. I can't even say if I enjoyed it or not. I felt the exact same way, and I'm so glad to hear someone else say it. Because I was like, any book that focuses on, like, diversity and minorities, like, I just want to, like, love it. But this is, like, a pink cat in just, like, bizarre scenarios. And it was, like, it just went from, like, super heavy and dark to just, like, really light and comical, just, like, at panel to panel. It was the... it was so strange. Yeah, I'll agree with I that. I don't, so I don't think, I can, I can see what you're saying. I think, and I think you make a good point. But I think 
it never felt lighthearted to me ever. I don't know why. It just didn't. I felt like kind of immersed from the beginning. I really especially love the couple, the white couple that are popping up oh. throughout the story, but not tied to the story, that are excited for their night out. And they're like this 50s um, older couple. And they're and on they a go date. and watch a fucking execution. Yeah, they've got tickets to the show this whole time, and the husband's constantly getting distracted and like, but he's very excited to be taking his wife out to such an like extravagant date night, and that's the end goal. Of this show that they're gonna go watch is an execution of one of the Rosenbergs. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They're very so. There's some representative of just like Americans who don't care to yeah. know more than what the. TV's telling them. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's also, yeah, yeah, just critical of general entertainment, you know? Right. Also, can you do that? Can you buy tickets to executions because... <laughs> no, you can't. Come yeah, on. I, Greg, Greg's been wasting it. away on his Faces of Death collection and he could have <laughs> had the real thing. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, can you imagine how much Ticketmaster would make on those? <laughs> totally, yeah. <laughs> this is all just a joke, yeah, I'll obviously. <laughs> See ya. Do with it what I will. Uh, did you guys watch Saddam Hussein's? Yes. You did? So did mm, I. No. If there is ever a thing that says you shouldn't watch it and it's, like, too brutal, I am instantly Googling that shit and looking at it. If hell were a place where they're, like, you... Or if I got to hell by saying, like, you could... You have to... You can't think of this thought, I would instantly go to hell. I'm, like, the guy that, like, has to do the thing that he's not Well, yeah, it's to human do. nature. You think? Okay, good. I just thought I was a bad, bad boy. If hell does exist... <laughs> if hell does exist, I think a lot more people are going to be there than you think. Okay. Well, I'll say that... Spending a couple years as a nurse and just seeing people like filleted on a table just desensitizes you to so much stuff Ugh. that it's just like so much of that just doesn't even phase me anymore. Like as as much as people don't want to admit that, I think once you go through the routine of seeing something a handful of times, it's just like this is what happens. This is a personal question for me. You've worked in a hospital for how long? Uh, you worked there for two years. Yeah, probably. Do people lose their faith, or do they find a faith working there? That's always just baffled me. Because, like, you really are just seeing, like, a body just pass. And, like, you kind of... Everything's broken down so scientifically, you're just like, this isn't... There's nothing fancy here. It's just... In my opinion, so many people were super jaded and... Didn't even care about living people. Ooh. Like, that job, at, depending on which hospital I was at, was more about um, a, an insurance checklist to make sure the hospital wouldn't get sued than it was about people. Mm. Which just hmm. ate away at me and was one of the main reasons I left that career. Back to relevancy of this comic. Yes. Uh... They they uh, somewhat they document like a death and they make it a stage and it's there's there's no blowback. You guys see that Logan Paul thing? He is a uh, he's a famous YouTuber that uh, goes about doing like jackass type of things. He went to the suicide forest in Japan and essentially made fun of a guy who had, who had hung himself and got a ton of like criticism and had to end his YouTube account. Uh, it, it's it's strangely similar to this where it's like. Actually, no. Watch that Black Mirror episode. Have you seen the new yeah, ones? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, where it's like, nope, not okay, not a thing that people do. Mm-mm. So. Is it confirmed that his YouTube channel got shut down? He shut it down, I think. It, it, but I don't know that it's confirmed. I read an article that it was like a plain devil's advocate. They're just like, you know what? He's actually going to get more popular because of this. Because there was a, a statistic on the web, the article that I read that like he got thousands of more subscribers on his YouTube channel after that because of all the yeah I still don't understand why what he what he does what he exists like we put we put more effort into this podcast than he does life and he's making millions yeah where my, where's my million somewhere it's waiting for <laughs> us buddy we got to keep doing it we do record in the chocolate castle though fudge fudge mansion <laughs> fudge mansion <laughs> we use that huge bank loan for <laughs> Really nice recording equipment in a fucking fudge castle. I'm wondering where this is going to fade out <laughs> when yeah. it actually what shows a, what up. What else is I mean, honestly, here's the thing. What else is there to say about this? It's a, it's a, it's a cartoon who he's now gay in the 1950s. And I think that 
We touched on the execution. That was good. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was supposed to hate this book. Like, as I read through it, I was like, is it su- like is it su- just su- the point of it just to be completely ridiculous? Um, no, it's actually not. The point of this is to be like super serious. It's actually DC's foray into like we're gonna do uh, a pretty like uh, interesting gay character type of thing. In fact, that's what they're really using Hanna Barbera this stuff for is to like jump into these other topics that they don't hit. Mm-hmm. Bear- I, like- I love the idea of like bringing these characters and doing something just like off the wall that you would never expect with them, but to take something kind of serious and then, like, put it with this illustration style and, like, in the mix of, like, all these other themes in here, it's just, like, you're making a fucking joke out of something that is, like, probably serious and important to a lot of people. Right. The other thing I would do is, like, okay, you're going to make this character who is... I wouldn't say beloved, but at least well-known. Yeah. You're going to make him gay. I wouldn't make the crux of the story on a time when, like, being gay was taboo and all that kind of stuff. I would just make him gay and then, like, let that play out. Like, it's like the narrative arc is his gayness. Well, and I think you up you modernize Snagglepuss, too, and it's like, yeah, obviously that character is gay. We live in a world where we can say that. And it shouldn't matter, right? Like, to your point, do it now. Instead of instead of ma- painting it in a world where it was taboo to be gay. Yeah. It's like, yeah. You think DC was embarrassed by this book? The, in the same week, they they released two two new characters in DC. Another, like, Batman type of person and a DC villain in this week. Mm-hmm. Not a, I mean, they're definitely, like, this wasn't, this is a big week for, for DC. Yeah, that normally if you have a new book coming out, no matter what it is, if it's not a big title, you do it in a week where you don't have other shit going on so more people take a chance on it. The comic shop, I one of you guys had to pick this comic up for me because the comic book shop I go to didn't even order it. Weird. That is weird. Because nobody fucking bought this probably. I will say this is a book that next month I'm going to like at least when I'm in the comic book store like pick up and be like what exact where exactly did that go <laughs> and like yeah. re- contemplate it def- buying it it did, it made it put enough intrigue in there for me that I would I would get the second issue you guys do great snagglepuss impressions too do you have any soup and crackers <laughs> yeah it's a little bit deep but he's definitely oh, okay. has a he definitely has like a little bit of a lisp and a thing to him hey snagglepuss while well, I got you here um can you tell the <laughs> listeners to uh Find us on iTunes and give us a five-star review. Yeah, so you simply <laughs> log on to your iTunes account, find us online, and rate that podcast a big old five stars. <laughs> Thanks, Snagglepuss. It's really great having you on the podcast today. <laughs> no problem. Now I'll just exit stage left. <laughs> All right. Bye, Snagglepuss. <laughs> uh, bye-bye. <laughs> this has been another edition of First Issue Club. We've loved it. We love comic books. We love you. And we hope that you loved it, too. I often find myself in a deep hole of depression, and the only (laughs) thing that can console me is comic books. This week on uh, First Issue Club, we had our theme music recorded by Primary Color Music. We recorded ourselves in the KCUR studios, and we are still a part of the... Fountain City Frequency family of podcasts. Matt Hodap, you still editing and producing this? Yeah, I am. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. You're welcome. <laughs> Demon, you still in here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Back, baby. <laughs> he was on you call. Can be, you can be king of the slams. I'll be queen of the callbacks. All right, yeah. <laughs> uh, Snagglepuss, you want to get in here and uh, say goodbye with us? Uh, hang on, can I, can I get back in? <laughs> Someone go let Snangle Puss in. The door's locked. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, here I am, <laughs> Snangle Puss. Hey, hey, there and he is. the fur and flesh. All right, well, Snangle Puss, it's time for us to sign off. So, oh, uh, no. Oh, I don't say. Yes. But I just got back. <laughs> well, we wanted you to, to uh, include yourself on this. Well, thank you too much, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank Hopefully you. Hopefully you can come back and do some more episodes. We'd love you to have you. You flatter me. I'd love to come back anytime. Oh, great, great. Where are you staying? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Obviously, you just flew in for the show, so. So I did. Normally, I'm on the, I'm on the west side in the boroughs, you know. Yeah. That's where all the great playwrights stay. Yeah, I tramp around a bit. You know me. Just wherever the wind takes you. Yeah, that's exactly right. Oh. There's always a little cat around the corner that I can <laughs> keep keep warm for the night. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much for having us. Oh, wait. <laughs> thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I guess. <laughs> All right, don't get snippy. Fine, I'm leaving. <laughs> Again? <laughs> <laughs> You're always in ears uh, call, though. <laughs> Was someone talking about me? <laughs> All right, now leave him out there. Is Sam Claus in? in. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is Greg Lichtai signing off. <laughs> this is Budget King. See ya. This is Mike to Stacy. Don't want to stand here and watch you go. But it's all right because I've got to go. Wow. <laughs> There's that, a lot of going. Yeah. Everybody's going somewhere yeah. in there. Enrique Iglesias. No, it was uh, S- Sandra Bullock. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the famous singer. <laughs> Let me in. Let me in. I left my watch in there. <laughs> Somebody get security on the phone. Sanglepuss is not leaving. <laughs> I'm Caitlin Rusick, and I will show myself out. Bye. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> oh, no. Not in the Hall of Fame of <laughs> First Issue Club podcast. <laughs>